You are listening to the Salugi Gamescast. My name is Justin Young, and joining me as usual are Alicia Utech, Ryan Frills, and OJ Duncan. How's everyone doing? It's actually been a pretty good day so far. Yeah. Quite well. I'm having an amazing day myself. How well, about you, Justin? That, that <laughs> sounds great. I'm glad everybody's having an amazing day. I have had a very busy day. So it hasn't been bad, uh, and I guess it's actually been good because the reason I've been busy, I've been uh, getting lots of inquiries about playing for pets, which is this Thursday and Friday, and so that's kept me very, very busy all day. I feel like I've sent more email today than I've sent in the last month. So, (laughs) um, you know, it's not a bad problem to have. At least people are interested. It would be much worse if nobody was (laughs) writing me back or calling me or whatever. Mm. Um, so how's the last week been? Sun is shining. It's going to stop shining this week, which is going to be a bummer, but the past week, sun is shining. It's been warm out. It's been great. Busy week, but a chill weekend. Yeah, I have a, I don't have a day off until the middle of May, which is entirely my fault, but, uh, so it's been pretty busy, but, but good. OJ, I know that you have some very personally exciting news mm-hmm. um, even though it affects lots of people on this campus uh, tell us why you're so personally excited okay so uh, I I have been the representative for the graduate and professional student council um, at SIU on the traffic and parking committee and for the pet so I've been there since 2018-2019 uh, academic year And the people before me there, too, have always been pushing for the same thing, and that is for graduate students to be able to get blue stickers on campus to park in, like, the faculty parking lots. Um, We have very little control over our schedule and the locations where the classes that we teach and the classes that we take are. So I've had um, some of my constituents who had to go completely across campus back and forth um, in 10 minutes back to back. Um, So we voted today to allow graduate assistants that have an appointment on campus to get a blue sticker um, to park in those faculty parking lots. Um, So that's a huge, gigantic win for graduate students and a recognition of all the stuff that we do on campus. Yeah, I know that uh, Jody, who's in our class, has talked to me about the fact that her husband has to come pick her up and drive her across campus Mm -hmm. to get to the class that she's teaching from Mm -hmm. the class that she's taking in the like 10 minutes in between those, which, Mm -hmm. you know, I always think like on a campus this big, you know, getting from one end to the other in 10 minutes is an astronomical feat. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I had to relocate one of my classes this semester because I was going straight from being a student in one building to teaching on the seventh floor of the library in 10 minutes. And I was like, I can't do that. (laughs) I will, I will literally die. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, and students, uh, before we get our classes, like, given to us, where we're assigned to one, students are signing up dependent on where the class is. So if we change where it's located, sometimes we lose students who had to take it in that certain building because they're also fighting the same thing, too. So this will really, really help us so we don't have to change that and make things better for all students. Well, I mean, it sounds like potentially a win all around. So Mm -hmm. let's hope that that all works out and everything. And that's exciting when you've worked on something for a while to have it finally play out and pan out and everything. Um, We'll go ahead. I mentioned playing for pets. Uh, I'll go ahead and talk about here at the top this Thursday and Friday, April 7th and 8th. We will be doing a 24 hour live stream, 12 hours on each day of SIU faculty, students, and staff playing video games together to raise money for St. Francis Care, a local no-kill animal shelter here in the Carbondale area. Um, If you are an SIU faculty, staff, or student, you can come join in, uh, just show up and everything. It's room uh, COM 2010 um, on those days. And if you are not here local or not a student or not faculty or whatever, you can also tune in and watch it on playingforpets.com, and we'll be live streaming that. It'll also be on our social media streams as well. So uh, definitely tune in for that. That'll be fun and exciting. But let's get to some video game news. So we've been talking about this one for a few weeks, um, about the new PlayStation Plus tiers. They actually finally got announced. So we actually know what they are. There are three tiers going from currently one with PlayStation Plus. There is the Essential, the Extra, and the Premium tier. So the Essential tier is basically 
the current PlayStation Plus service. You're going to get two games a month uh, free as part of this service. It also allows you to do online play and everything, and it's going to be $60 a year. I didn't include the monthly prices because I don't think many people subscribe to these on a monthly basis. Uh, but the monthly basis is considerably higher. I think it's $10 a month for this. So you are saving basically 50% by paying in advance for the year. The extra tier is going to give you all that's on the essential tier, plus a catalog of 400 PS4 and PS5 games. Um, so that's going to be basically sort of what PlayStation uh, Now is currently and everything. You can download those games. Uh, that is a hundred dollars a year. Then there is the top premium tier, which is going to offer you three hundred and forty or so additional games on top of those four hundred games. Um, and these are going to be a mix of PlayStation, PlayStation Two, PlayStation Portable (PSP), and also PlayStation Plus, but only streaming on the PlayStation, or excuse me, on the PlayStation 3, only streaming on the PlayStation 3. So you cannot download those. The other ones you can download and run locally on your system. Uh, there will also be ga- some free game trials as part of that, uh, but none of these include day and date first-party releases like Xbox Game Pass does. Premium is $120 a year, so you're basically going $60, $100, or $120 for this service. Um, so I know OJ, you were excited about this previously. So now that we have the final details, how do you feel about it? Um, I feel good. I'm currently paying more than 120 a year, I believe for PlayStation plus and the PlayStation now. So, um, it'll be a little cheaper for everything that I'm getting. Um, I am a little upset that the PS3 games are only streaming though. Um, because I have, there's a few of them that I want to be able to download and play. And I, the PS5 can emulate a PS3 very easily, I'm assuming. So I, I'm still not sure why exactly we can't download those uh, because I really want the DLC on some of them. Yeah, that seems odd to me that PS3 would be streaming only. So my understanding is it has to do with the, um, the hardware architecture of the PlayStation 3. The PlayStation 3 is not built off of I guess what we would think of as normal standardized hardware uh, with other systems, um, you know, most game systems to now basically either run off an, an ARM chip like your cell phone does, so mm-hmm. that's the switch, uh, or um, are running off of basically a, a 46 architecture like your PC does. Mm-hmm. And so that's the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. The PlayStation 3 ran off of a custom chip called the Cell chip, Um, which at the time was Sony's argument that they were going to, this chip was going to be embedded into everything that you bought. Mm -hmm. It was going to be in your, um, your game console, but it was going to be in your phone and it was going to be in refrigerators and it was going to be, and all of these devices were going to be able to communicate with one another, which why your PlayStation needs to communicate with your refrigerator. (laughs) I do not know. Uh, but Sure. You know, if you're playing at midnight and you need a midnight snack. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, what World of Warcraft had that where it was what slash pizza where yeah. you could type that and order a pizza from Pizza Hut within the game and everything. <laughs> so um, you're, you're not too far off with that. Yeah. <laughs> and yet still Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles doesn't have it. Right. <gasps> right. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. I mean, the game's not out yet, so they could always change that. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's the main reason that different architecture, though OJ is right, the, you know, you can art, you can emulate a PlayStation 3 on a PC now uh, fairly well, um, mm-hmm. you know, and so it, it still seems like a weird omission, particularly when um, Microsoft has made all previous Xbox games, or at least generations, if not every specific game, uh, backwards compatible on their system. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Is, that, I, is the either of the other two of you interested in this? I would definitely be interested. Like I said, um, I grew up with like the original PlayStation and PlayStation Two, and so I I would definitely be interested to take a look at the catalog for premium and see what sort of stuff they have on there. Mm-hmm. 
Because I think if they, if they have a lot of those games that I played growing up, I would be... I would I would definitely want to spend that hundred and twenty dollars a year. I don't know if I could feasibly, <laughs> but I would definitely want to. <laughs> Maybe not now that your parking uh, tag is going to go up <laughs> ever so slightly. Um, yeah, I don't know. Are, are there PlayStation One or PlayStation Two games that you currently really desire to go back and play? Because I feel like everybody talks about backwards compatibility. But then do people actually want to do backwards compatibility? Absolutely. (laughs) I would love to go back and be able to play things like Final Fantasy VIII and the original Spyro games and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. You know, those are the games that I remember playing those with my sister and, like, we would take turns. She played Final Fantasy VII and I played VIII and then we took turns watching each other and playing the other games. And so that would... I think be a huge thing for me, be able to just not only go back and play those games again, but also bringing back that nostalgia and being able to share that with my sister again would be super cool. And I think also even the PS2 games, because our PS2, rest in peace, it lasted us a long time, but (laughs) (laughs) we haven't been able to turn it on for the past couple of years, and so... A lot of those games, you know, the Sonic games and the early Kingdom Hearts games and stuff like that. I really miss playing those. Mm-hmm. So I, I would, I would love to be able to go back and play those again. And having that backwards compatibility would be really nice. Yeah, I would like it too. Um, there's like a bunch of game. A lot of it's for games I didn't really get to play back in the heyday. Like for whatever reason, like I. I just didn't have an interest in the Silent Hill games back then. Now I do. Um, so it'd be cool to go back and play those. Uh, that that would be my main reason. It's just my still issue is, like, I still need to... I haven't bought a PlayStation since PlayStation 2. It's been a while. Mm-hmm. I've been using either Nintendos or Xboxes since then. Um, and just... That's still a good penny. Um, but, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it makes it more tempting for sure. Yeah, I mean... It- you know, you talk about games that you didn't even feel particular interest in, like the Silent Hill mm-hmm. franchise. Um, but for me, it's also a lot of looking back and going, I didn't have the money to buy mm-hmm. these games at that time. Yeah. Right? Like, there were games back in the PlayStation 2 era where, you know, I would have been college, um, and I just didn't have the cash to go buy those games at that point. You know, not as many as maybe I do now, and... Um, maybe that says some bad things about how I spend my money now. (laughs) Um, But, you know, something like this, uh, yeah, I mean, I I find myself going back and playing some of those Xbox games from the first-generation Xbox, and so I find myself going back and playing, um, um, you know, whether it's the original Halos or some of the weirder games like Blink's The Time Sweeper um, that I just want to go back and experience because either I did at the time, but maybe it was a rental at the time, and now I could actually sit down and spend some time playing through it and everything. Mm-hmm. Crimson Skies is a really great one on the original Xbox that uh, I like going back and experiencing. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't decided yet um, if that top tier is worth it to me. They make it very tempting, though, at 100 mm-hmm. compared to 120 It's only $20 more. Like, right. Surely Mm -hmm. it's worth it just to play some old PlayStation 1 and 2 games. Yeah, and um, so I can tell you Final Fantasy 7, 8, 9, 10, 10, 2, and 12 are on PlayStation now. Um, You can play them all. And you can also get some of those on the Switch, too. Mm -hmm. Right, can you? uh, Final Fantasy 7, 8, and 9, I know you can. Okay. Wait, I can get 8 on the Switch? Yeah. Yeah. I know where my next... Spending is going to be. It's like, ten, <laughs> it's like 10 bucks too. So I, I feel like 10 and 12 also came out on the Switch. I'm pretty sure at least 10 did. Um, and I feel like 12 maybe did as well because they did that new update of 12 where it has all the like sort of, um, you know, like just making it more comfortable to play through and everything. Like you can turn on auto battles and speed up the battles mm-hmm. and everything, have them play at two or three times the normal speed. So, um, yeah, I mean, th- I think it sounds like a, a pretty decent deal. It's still not as good of a deal as um, as Xbox Game Pass, but Xbox Game Pass, 
it does not offer a yearly discount. So you're paying $15 a month. So you're paying $180 a year for that. Oh. Um, and, you know, again, if you only buy three games a year, that's completely worth it if those are first-party Xbox games. But, you know, this is slightly cheaper, and it should be slightly cheaper <laughs> given <laughs> that it's not offering those first-party titles. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, we talked about this and said it was pretty much already as good as gold, but it is official now. E3 is canceled for 2022. So there is no in-person E3, no digital version of E3. E3 is just dead for this year. Um, and Jeff Keeley, who has a long history of working in the games industry, both as a journalist and more recently as sort of a, a host figure for a lot of gaming events, um, he, a few years back, started what he called the Summer Games Fest, which um, is sort of a, a digital stand-in for E3. And he has stepped up and said, hey, we're still doing it this year. So it looks like most of the game news and announcements and everything will be centered around Summer Game Fest. Um, I know we kind of talked about this earlier, and most of you said you hadn't really ever watched E3 other than maybe some highlights and everything of it. Um but this is kind of sad for me, uh, you know, growing up, I remember the first E3 and it, you know, and CES, the consumer electronics show before it. Um, and it always seemed really exciting to go to. And of course, those were the days back when companies were spending millions of dollars and like building, you know, they have a new Donkey Kong country game coming out and they'll like build, you know, like the airplane from Donkey Kong Country and like mm -hmm. have like, you know, a giant banana and have like an obstacle course you can go <laughs> through and everything. And that sort of stuff just always looked amazing. And E3 hasn't exactly been that for several years now. Um, and I just don't feel like it's probably coming back after this. Um, you know, something probably will replace it. Something will probably step in. But this seems like the end. E3 and after some 25 years that's there's something kind of sad about that to see it mm -hmm. die uh, speaking of PlayStation Plus they have announced their games for April so if you are a subscriber to PlayStation Plus on any tier right now <laughs> because there is only one tier um, you get the games Hoods, Outlaws and Legends uh, Slay the Spire and SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated, <laughs> which is their sort of remake of that game. Um, I think that's originally like a PlayStation 2 game. So it's a, it's a pretty good looking remake and everything of it. So I had no idea what Hoods is. <laughs> <laughs> that game, the, the title, it feels like the more you read of that title, the less ideal you have what that game is. Because <laughs> right, when it's right. like hoods, you're like, okay, I could think of a few things that might be about. And then outlaws, okay, so one of those I'm kind of centering on. And then and legends, I have no idea what it is. <laughs> so um, check those out. Meanwhile, on Xbox, their uh, games with gold for April include another site, Hugh Outpost Coloki X, and MX versus ATV Alive. So that last one is a um, you know a motorcycle versus ATV racing game. Um, some of those in the past have been good. The ones that. I think the name of the studio was Rainbow Studios used to make for the PlayStation 2. Those were really fun games, but I haven't played too many of those MX ATV games lately. I know Hue is pretty neat, and then the other two I've never even heard of. I have no idea what Outpost Kaloki X is. Is that an anime thing? It's not one that I've heard of. Me neither. Yeah, me either. It sounds like an anime thing, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah. It, it should be anime if it's not. <laughs> Um, Activision Blizzard has settled a sexual harassment lawsuit for $18 million that they are placing into a relief fund that uh, people who feel they have been sexually harassed can uh, apply for those funds and uh, assume through lawyers that's being worked out how those will be distributed and everything. So this settles some of the problems around Activision Blizzard. And I sort of wonder if this is a situation where with Microsoft buying them out, if 
they just, you know, they want to get all of this off their books mm-hmm. right now. Right. Um, you know, Microsoft doesn't want it being there when they officially take over the company. Mm-hmm. Well, and I say good that they have this fun, but also like make changes. Don't let this happen again. Don't make the situation where more people need a fund like this. Right. Yeah. I always get worried when I hear things like this are just settled. It's like, okay, this is great, but what's happening moving forward to make sure that it doesn't happen again? Like you said, it's okay. What are we doing with the company culture? What are we doing with HR stuff like Mm -hmm. that, that, yeah, and maybe they are doing those things and they're just not publicizing it, mm-hmm. but I think especially when you have something as public as everything that Activision Blizzard has gone through, I think that there needs to be some publication of mm-hmm. what you're doing to make things better moving forward. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, I, I very much agree with that. Um, you know, we have something in the news this morning about, that I feel like ties into this with Louis C.K., Louis C.K. won a Grammy last night for his comedy album, which is about his going, his, um, I don't want to say going through because that makes it sound like he suffered. Yeah, his experience with the women coming out and accusing him and like his career kind of falling apart and everything. So Louis C.K., who masturbated in front of women, including women who were in, my understanding employed by him then goes and records an album about it and wins a Grammy for it, which seems like exactly kind of Alicia, what you're talking about. Like, yes, there was some repercussion immediately after, but obviously nothing has been learned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like there seems to be no sort of, Oh, well, you know, here are the long-term repercussions and here's how we're going to change things going forward. Cause it very much feels like, sort of like that in this situation Mm -hmm. without any sort of public statement about here's what we're doing to make things better. And even that, right. That's, that's, that's PR. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it it will really matter how the employees there on the ground working in Activision Blizzard say that things change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, all right. So here's, Here's just an insane story. Um, I feel like this is the craziest story of the week. Hackers have stole $620 million in Ethereum, which is a cryptocurrency, and and in cash. Uh, I believe it was something close to $600 million in Ethereum and about $20 million in cash um, from the Ronin network which supports blockchain uh, NFT game Axie Infinity. $620 million, half a billion dollars that they stole from this game. Um, So if you're not familiar with NFT games, you know, NFTs are basically non-fungible tokens. That's what NFT stands for. And the idea behind it is that you could buy something digitally and have... Uh, permanent possession of it uh, that would travel with you. You could move it to somewhere else. So theoretically, if you bought something within a game, you could take it and move it to a different game. That's never going to happen Mm -hmm. because everybody wants to get their cut. So there's no value for companies doing that. But that's the idea. The other idea is that, uh, you know, if you were playing, say, a Pokemon game digitally, and you got a Squirtle card that would be an NFT, and you could actually sell that to another player. Now, we already have auction houses within games, particularly MMOs, where you can take an item and sell it to somebody else, Mm -hmm. and that's not an NFT. And the big difference is that NFTs uh, use a whole lot of processing power and are horrible for the environment. So Mm -hmm. they're a bad thing to begin with. But this game had $600 million (laughs) worth of value in it that somebody could actually steal it. And there's no way to get this back. Like, that's the value of an NFT is that it is a singular item that once you have it, you have possession of it. So there's no, there's not necessarily any way to recover this. And, you know, 
I think that's a, a pretty scary thought process because right now, if um, you know, if if you lose an item within a game, you can contact whoever runs that game and potentially get that item back in you know in World of Warcraft or something. Let's say, in this, you're just kind of out of luck. And it may not even be something within the game that's happening. It may be people robbing the game, you know, via hackers. So I didn't know um, if any of you had been paying much attention to NFTs and their integration into video games. I have been only enough to know that they're terrible. I'm not <laughs> invested in it. And this is just cemented that <laughs> like definitely mm-hmm. don't want to now if it's that easy to just lose it all. <laughs> Right. Gotta one, look. one of the arguments is always that like, oh, no one can take it from you. You own it. You have that part of the blockchain. It's all <laughs> yours. Nobody can take it from you. Psych. Right? Yeah. And now it's like, oh, here's $620 million worth of um, like Ethereum and money um, in here. Just take it and they can't get it back. So, oops. <laughs> yeah. <Nice. laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it just it seems like such a a bewildering use of technology where, you know, from the outside looking in, this just seems like such a horrible idea. And now we see it playing out in real time, you know, example after example of just how terrible of an idea this is at game developers conference, which was last week, week before, um, I know they said on the show floor, there were many, many tables set up about NFTs and using the blockchain for game development. And this, you know, the actual game developers are very anti this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, This is usually coming down from on high from the corporate executives. And this just seems to be more fuel to the fire about why Game developers and players are all against this. It is only corporate executives mm-hmm. who are gungo about this. Right. Which now that money's now that all the monies have been taken, maybe corporate executives will kind of back off, mm-hmm. hopefully. Probably not, but probably yeah, not. We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I think mean, probably not. Um, you know, our our previous story about Activision Blizzard learning the lesson, yeah, you know, I think kind of shows us they they just don't learn sometimes. Um, Zelda Breath of the Wild 2, that's the working name, it's not an official title, um, has been delayed until spring 2023. So any disappointment over Zelda getting pushed back yet I'm, again? I'm disappointed, but I'm also like happy that they have more time um, for hopefully a better product. Because I was assuming it would be good anyway, but they have more time, even better. Yeah, right. it's a bummer, but it's something like I think... I'm willing to wait for, and my head just went into Hamilton music, but I'm not going <laughs> to sing it. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm happy to wait for it. Plus, we like there's plenty of good stuff to play till then, so I'm I'm not upset really. I also say too, the Breath of the Wild community online is still super active. Like, if anyone's familiar, there's a Twitch streamer slash YouTuber called Point Crow who commissioned finally getting a Breath of the Wild multiplayer online, and it is finally good to go. Like, people can start playing it now. So I feel like there, there's still things, there's still content for Breath of the Wild that is there to enjoy and explore up to this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, you know, of course, I think most people would rather them take all the time that they need. And earlier we, a few weeks ago, we talked about, they announced the new Pokemon game. Is it generation nine? Generation nine. Um, And that game is coming out this fall. So it feels like Nintendo doesn't need uh, the Zelda release this fall. Like Mm -hmm. their calendar is going to be full enough. You know, that will be their big ticket item this fall. That'll be their, you know, game that sells 20 million copies within a month or something <laughs> yeah. like those, uh, like those games tend to. Um, we talked about Fortnite adding a zero build mode. So when their new season began, they uh, cut off all the building. You couldn't build anything anymore. You just had to run around and shoot. And they have now added this as a permanent mode into the game. I think at the time I joked about, I think, you know, they'll just roll this out and this will just be the game from here on out. 
it's not going to be the game. It's going to be a mode within the game. Mm-hmm. So if you want to play Fortnite and not deal with having to build a skyscraper every time you try <laughs> to shoot somebody, which I feel like turns a lot of people off from that game who might like other uh, Battle Royale shooters like Apex Legends and that sort of thing, um, this is going to stick around. And I think it might be popular. I think it's a good idea on their part, even though I'm not really a Fortnite fan. I still think this is smart. Yeah, if I, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to lie, I don't want to play Fortnite anyway. Um, it's just not that fun to me. But I'd probably prefer this because, like, I've tr- I, I think the building stuff is cool in theory. I just don't like how it feels and how it plays when I'm playing it. It just, it feels, like, really clunky and finicky, and I'm just not too keen on it myself. I also just don't want to be playing a game where I'm trying to shoot another player and some seven-year-old is controlling it and building, like, the Sistine Chapel around themselves. Because <laughs> I feel like it's bad enough that the seven-year-old is shooting and killing me, but they don't have to rub it in while, you know, <laughs> showing off their architecture degree at the same time. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it certainly can only help that game uh, by adding that in. Um Indie studio, uh, Funomina, I don't know how to actually pronounce their name. Um, They are the developers of Wadom, which uh, was a game that was forever in development, but it finally came out. Um, It's by the uh, developer of Katarami de Marcy, uh, if you ever played that game where you're rolling around a ball and rolling up all the environment into this giant ball. Mm -hmm. Um, But Wadom's a pretty good game, But the studio is now shutting down, Um, and this is it seems to be directly tied to a video that came out from the YouTube channel People Make Games, uh, particularly one done by Chris Pratt, not not Chris Pratt, not the Guardians of the (laughs) Galaxy or Mario voice guy or Garfield. (laughs) Oh right, he is doing Garfield. That's, that seems like the worst one of all to me. <laughs> I mean, we had Lorenzo Music doing Garfield, like a great voice actor. And, you know, uh, Chris Pratt's fine. He just, he's not like the most talented voice actor, I don't feel like. Um, or actor. And also has his own toxic behavior. Yeah, he's got, he's got some issues there, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, but anyways, um, Brat for people make who makes games, uh, people makes games. Uh, sorry, um, did a video where they they looked into three different indie studios. I think we talked about this briefly um, in a previous episode, uh, but they looked into Funamina, um, and particularly, again, allegations of toxic behavior. Uh, this centered around the co-founder uh, Robin Hunicky. Um, uh, who apparently uh, people have accused her of emotional abuse and humiliation. So there were stories about um, there were stories about people like opening up to her and talking about their relationships, talking about their sexuality, and her then dropping this during the middle of meetings with multiple people around. Jesus, and um, and so that's where this is apparently all coming from those are the allegations again you know um we don't we don't know 100 percent whether those are true or not but you know they're pretty serious allegations and pretty bizarre allegations not you know some of the ones that we're used to um um, but that looks like it's the end of that studio and everything they were they sent an email out to employees saying, hey, we're trying to get a last-ditch effort of funding to come in, uh, but also you should probably be looking for another job. Yeah. Um, and with very little you know, time announcement for that. Um, there is a video that's been released online of a new Gex game. It's actually an old Gex game called Gex Jr. So... Gex was a game that originated on the 3DO, um, and it was you are a gecko wandering around, and you wander in the original, at least you wander through different TV-themed episodes. So, like, there's an episode where you're going through a graveyard and everything, and it's playing off all sorts of jokes about zombie and, you know, uh, Frankenstein movies and all that, and... um, 
and also Thriller, uh, the Michael Jackson <laughs> song and video. Um, Dana Gould, the stand-up comic, was famously the voice of Gax, so it was actually one of the notable things. It was actually good voice acting for the time. Dana Gould was actually a very good voice mm-hmm. actor when most of the time voice acting of that era was being done by, hey, you know, get Bill from accounting in here. Let him do <laughs> a voice. So they actually went out and got a good voice actor. And there's, I feel like, some love for those, uh, at least first couple of Gex games. But apparently they were working on a game called Gex Jr. for the PlayStation. And somebody found a demo of this on a CDR that somebody had burned. And, um, and now they've put up a video online of it. And I guess there's some doubts of whether this is real or not, but it, it seems to be real. I've watched the video. It looks very much like a PlayStation era game. So if somebody is making a fake one of these, they really went out of their way to do it. And, you know, these sorts of things are always coming out, lost games that people are finding. Um, and there's been a lot of effort by different groups to preserve these, you know, right. so that they can back them up. And even if they're not putting them online, they're putting them out there um, into an archive so that they can save them at least. I know the Video Game History Foundation, I think I've mentioned them before on this podcast, Um, They were talking just this last week about now whenever somebody gets a very rare cartridge or prototype cartridge uh, graded by one of the national groups that does grading on those, like you would grade a baseball card, for example, um, that they go through the Video Game History Foundation and as part of their deal, they back up that game. And they store that back up in their archive. So even if the person buying it doesn't want that game released publicly, they still have a backup in their archive. So theoretically, that game will never be lost and everything, okay. which is fantastic work. Mm-hmm. Good for them. Um, last week, at the end of the week, there was a big rumor that PlayStation was going to acquire a quote-unquote major studio. And Konami was the one that everybody kind of rushed to. Uh, but I know Jeff Grubb over at uh, GamesBeat uh, said that Konami was not the company he was hearing, but it was indeed a major studio. And so, you know, I think something bigger than their acquisition of Bungie recently. So people were thinking this was going to be something, you know, Maybe not on the scale of the Activision Blizzard acquisition from um, from Microsoft, but something that would get that sort of attention. Um, mm. Konami, Capcom, From Software has been one of the ones after mm. Elden Ring that has been rumored. Mm-hmm. So it seems likely that um, at least those negotiations are going on, but you know, we probably won't know anything until we know anything. Yeah. There's a lot of real big moves happening lately. So like I'm wondering what what's going on in the industry. So my understanding is that it has to do with inflation. So all these companies have a bunch of money sitting in their banks mm-hmm. right now. And all this money is worth more right now than it will be any time in the future. Mm-hmm. So you're almost better served by taking it and investing it in something, acquiring something Mm -hmm. right now with it. And so all of them are trying to go out and spend money. And of course, as they're going out and trying to spend money, all the smaller developers and studios are looking around saying, this is our best chance to sell and Mm -hmm. get a big payday. Mm -hmm. So you get, you know, a company like Bungie selling, what was it, $3 billion, I mm-hmm. think they sold, which seems like a crazy figure just a few years ago for Bungie. Yeah. Um, I mean, they make one game, right? Mm-hmm. So <laughs> it, it seems like a crazy figure, so. Just have this image of, like, Mickey Mouse, like, watching all this, like, on a series of surveillance cameras, being like, <laughs> but soon you'll all be mine anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But, but Disney got out of video games. You know, they had their own game studios and they sewed all that off and or shut it down. So, and, you know. They got some other game, though, going on. Uh, not a game studio necessarily, but I saw some other game they were doing. Yeah, they're all they're licensing out all their yeah. games mm-hmm. to people okay. now. So, um, speaking of which, uh, one of those that they own is Lucasfilm. Uh, from back in the day that was, you know, George Lucas's uh, game branch that he made a lot of 
uh, Star Wars and Indiana Jones and a lot of early uh, point-and-click adventure games, they announced today they're making a new game, Return to Monkey Island. This is intended as the true sequel to Monkey Island 2. And the most exciting part, I think, to people is not that we're getting a new Monkey Island game, but that Ron Gilbert and Dave Grossman are coming back to work on that game. Um, Ron Gilbert is one of those big names in the history of point-and-click adventure games. Uh, he worked on a lot of those LucasArts games or LucasFilm games, depending on uh, which era it's from. Um, and so he's apparently been working on this game in secret for the last two years, and the game is coming out this year. So I am super excited about this. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I love those games. Um, if you've never played one of the Monkey Island games, they did remasters of the first two a couple years ago, and those are fantastic. And they're cheap, and they'll run on just about anything. So even like on a laptop, uh, mm-hmm. get those games. They're Two of the only games that I think actually gets humor in video games right. Mm -hmm. Like humor is so difficult to do in a video game because there's a good chance you're going to play back through that same part over and over again. And any joke kind of loses its edge. And in, um, in those two games, it actually works. So Mm -hmm. um, they're amazing games. I am very, very, very excited about this. Uh, Anyone, even if you have to download scum VM and play the old versions, just, play those games and get ready for it, the new ones. I'm curious to go back and look at those because those are some of those games that, like, I, you know, I have no, I never played, but I kind of want to go back and check out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, completely worth completely worth the time, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I would actively encourage people. Um, kind of difficult a, a bit because a lot of, you know, goofy puzzle logic that a lot of those adventure games have, but you just, you know, even if you're playing with a walkthrough, it's still a fun experience to have. Um, you know, just for the jokes, just for the lines and everything in it. Um, and one last news item here. This is stupid. Um, <laughs> Coca-Cola has announced a new flavor, Coca-Cola Zero Sugar Bite, B-Y-T-E, so spelt like a computer bite. Um, this is their new pixel-flavored cola coming uh, first as an item within f- Fortnite, <laughs> and then it will come to stores in May. See, you said pixel flavored, but my brain went to pixie sticks. Because <laughs> I'm like, what does a pixel taste like? Well, it says it's zero sugar, so it is not pixie sticks. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> that is pure sugar. <laughs> but seriously, what what does a pixel taste like? Like, does it... Does it change depending on the color of the pixel? Does it just have a single taste? Like, I don't know. Last week we talked about <laughs> if uh, Kirby ate you, what would it be like? <laughs> so what would it be like if you ate Kirby? What does Kirby <laughs> taste like? Oh. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> ask Ryu. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, I, <laughs> there's a deep cut for people who have been listening to every episode. <laughs> um, like I, I feel like Kirby probably tastes like like a marshmallow. I was thinking bubble gum. I was thinking bubble very gum? rubbery. Rubbery. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. What do you think, OJ? Uh, bubble gum or cotton candy? I think because when I think of pink, I, I think of those flavors. So that's true. That's very cotton candy. Like I was thinking, like a like he tastes like a peep, mm-hmm. like a marshmallow, but kind of a mm. harder marshmallow. But, but we've seen now see with that. mouthful mode that he's so stretchy. <laughs> that's that's true. But cotton candy, I mean, it doesn't hold mm-hmm. its form when it stretches. Bubble gum is right. probably the best you know metaphor there for him. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> But in that case, you can't swallow him. So you've got to chew up Kirby and then spit him out, right? Mm. Real world mouthful mode. I swallow gum. <laughs> <laughs> I swallow gum so you could swallow it. Um, yeah, so I, I do not know what Pixel tastes like. Um, your guess is <laughs> as good as mine what Pixel tastes like. Um, they... So they recently had space-flavored Coca-Cola. Mm-hmm. Has anybody tried that? Nope. 
What? <laughs> I've I've heard varying different like ideas of what it tastes like. I um, feel like it would just taste like dust. <laughs> well, so the, the there's an article that came out a while back that talked about how like the middle of the Milky Way galaxy would taste like raspberry liquor because of the the things that are in the center of the galaxy. So if something were galaxy flavored, it would taste like raspberry liquor or liqueur, not liquor, or both, I guess. But. Um, <laughs> So I would assume it tasted like that. And I heard some people say that it did taste like that, but other people said it tasted like something wildly different. So I have a feeling it's like um, those dum dum suckers mm-hmm. where, you know, at the end of the run, the flavors all mix together and mm-hmm. they release them as mystery flavors. <laughs> right. So I think that's what Coca Cola is doing. And they're like, no, it's space flavored. No, it's pixel flavored. <laughs> And it's really like Coca-Cola, Sprite, and Dr. Pepper all mixed together. It tastes like cilantro. That's what it tastes like. Oh, <laughs> oh man. I don't like cilantro either. <laughs> There's a lot of cilantro hate among you people. I don't know what it is with the grad it tastes, students. It tastes like soap. Yeah. <laughs> like soap or like dust. Huh. Like There is no good cilantro. Sorry, mm. not sorry. <laughs> well, then it tastes like space, right? If it tastes like dust. <laughs> I guess. So they couldn't call it Coca-Cola cilantro. So they called it Coca-Cola space. Somebody would want that though. <laughs> Coca-Cola hand soap. <laughs> oh. Um, all right, let's move over to what you've been playing. And Alicia, what have you been playing this last week? I'm guessing more Kirby. Yes, more Kirby. I'm right before the third boss fight, but I, f- I also went back finally and did like some of the mini games, some of the... You have the ability to go back and do specific levels to gain stars to power up your copy abilities. And so I had been putting them off because I've been playing co-op with my boyfriend, but I went back and played some of those last night because I was hanging out after calling my sister. And some of them are really hard. (laughs) The pipe mouth one Mm -hmm. is you have to time those jumps perfectly at the end there. So I'm still having a really great time with it, though. I... Also found out, like, you know, last time I talked about how the open world stuff isn't really quite as open world as I would have hoped, because you're still just, you're on the open world map, but you're still just kind of taking the star from one level Mm -hmm. to the next. But you also get to actually poke around and search for things. So you search and, like, a star coin will pop up, or another copy ability level will pop up. So I'm discovering more of the open world aspect and Mm -hmm. still having a lot of fun with it. Good, good. Anything else? Uh, a little more Pokemon Legends Arceus, but those those have still been the two big ones. I think probably money wise, those are going to stay the two big ones. Although now that I know I can get Final Fantasy VIII for ten bucks on Switch, <laughs> I probably shouldn't until summer when I have time. But is that what you were doing over there, googling to look at the <laughs> price? <laughs> <laughs> I saw you with your phone out, so I guess <laughs> figuring out the pricing on it. I don't have my phone out. I'm. I'm just looking at the piece of paper here that has our... (laughs) Um, All right. So, um, yeah, that that Pokemon game, I assume, will keep you busy for a few months with it. I think so. And I think it's really fun because... I've I've gotten spoiled on a couple of the big things. Like, I know about Volo and things like that, but... I've managed to avoid still finding out the entire plot. So, like, I don't know all of the noble Pokemon that I'm going to have to face. And so, like, Ursa Luna, for example, was a big shock for me. I was like, holy cow, they gave a Teddy Ursa, Ursa Rang, another? What? That's <laughs> great. So I'm still having fun discovering the new Pokemon that are in the game, I feel like, which is really great. All right, great. Uh, Ryan, what have you been playing this week? So this week, uh, after multiple like times I've been told this, this is something I should play, I have finally started like the uh, Phoenix Wright type games. And I've started with the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles, since those were like the prequels to it. Um, and I think I read, I watched some YouTube video that said that, hey, if you're going to play these, go ahead and play the, this first. Like the first, like the first game of this is like very instructional on how the future ones go. So I'm really enjoying it so far. Uh I like how, like, I like how the way, like, you get game pieces of evidence over the course of the game, and you have to pick and choose, like, which evidence to show at which time, and you do have to, like, think about it, like, 
And I'll find myself, like, thinking, like, for multiple reasons, a different piece of evidence might feel more fitting, and sometimes I'll be like, oh, wait, no, it should have been this piece of evidence. Um, so I like how it... So there in, like, AI the Somnium Files, you had, like, interrogations where you had to collect, show pieces of evidence to the people you're interrogating, and I think this does that a lot better, mm -hmm. um, that part of that. Because, uh, and I also like the fact that, that you can... Um, in that game, it was just trial and error until you finally get it. In this game, there is, like, some tension over if you show the wrong thing or you interrupt the court with the wrong thing. Like, that can have a negative consequence for you in the game. Um, I also just really love, like, the character design in it and, like, how the, you know, a Super iPad Wolf is a YouTuber I like and he talks about how good character design uh, tells you things about the characters and I think they do a really good job about that with that in this game. Um, I also love, like, the character animations in it, and the overall story is just really nice. Um, I'm, I've played through the first episode of it. I think there's five episodes in this first game, and I'm, I'm now, like, making my dent in the second one, and I'm really enjoying it. Objection. <laughs> yeah, now, now you finally get the meme, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I really love those uh, those original uh, Ace Attorney games, and I haven't played the new one that you're talking about and playing through. Um, but those original Ace Attorney games are just fantastic. I mean, and they're of course they were made for um, the DS, so they're bite sized and you know kind of easy to take a, play a little here and then go do something and come back to them. So um, really, a lot of fun games. Have you played La Noir? I played a little bit of it a long time ago. It's one I need to jump back to at some point. So you were talking about like finding the evidence and figuring out when to use it and everything. And that yeah. game is very much that way with the interrogations, like yeah. about, okay, what do I bring up at this point to this particular person and everything? Right. Uh, so I think you would like that. Um, all right. OJ, what are you playing? Um, so I've talked about it a couple times here, and so I went back and I'm playing it on PlayStation now, uh, Castlevania Harmony of Despair, uh, which is like an online uh, version of Castlevania where it brings characters from um, other Castlevania games in together and like getting all mixed, and there's different levels from different games. Um, so my favorite character has always been Charlotte, and she absorbs the spells from the enemies. So this is the third time I'm going through and having to absorb the spells from all the enemies because we... Um, we played it originally on the PS3, um, and so I had everything, um, and then we lost that save, and we started playing again on the PS3, um, because that's the only place where you can play with all the DLC still. Um, and then our PS3 isn't working very well, so now I'm doing it on PS Now in hopes that they will give us the DLC at some point in the game, because they only have the first DLC. Um, so I've been playing that a little bit, and I play... Um, a, group of games from uh, Grumpy Rhino Studios. Um, and there's one, a game called Idle Apocalypse and then Idle Mastermind, which are two idle games that I've been playing for a few years now. And they're, they're really fun. Um, and I like idle games just as I'm getting ready for bed at night, I'll go through and like do all the stuff I need to do during the day and then just let it play throughout the day. Um, and they released a new game called Necro Merger, which is, um, so in all the games you're like a villain, which is part of the, the, the fun of them for me because you're always you usually always play heroes right but you're always the villain you're a mastermind that's taking over the city um, or you're like the head of an evil um, like doom cult that's bringing back like these um, uh, like big monsters to destroy the world and you always fail because you know they're they're not very good villains right so in necro merger it's like a merging game um, and you're you're taking you get all of these little things that pop up like there's uh, eye monsters and there's zombies and skeletons and werewolves and mummies and stuff, um, and you're merging them all and then you merge them to make bigger versions of each one, um, and then you're feeding the devourer which is like this enemy and as you feed him more you like level up and you get more space on the playing field and stuff. It's really fun. I suggest all the Grumpy Rhino games and I think Necro Merger is early access right now. Um, but if you're looking for a good idle game, idle apocalypse, idle mastermind, and um, Necro Merger is not really idle. It's kind of idle, but um, they're really good games, and that's Grumpy Rhino Studios. And are, are these available on mobile or are these PC? Um, they're mobile. So they're on Android. Um, I think they're iOS, but I'm not 100%. Oh, well, let's check real quick and see. We <laughs> All right. can always look. If somebody else wants to talk while I look up. 
Idol um, Mastermind? Yeah, Idol Mastermind. Um, and they're, they're really fun games. They're they're campy. You're a villain. Um, and it's, it's just, it's really fun within them. I'm just picturing um, this with, like, the old-style James Bond villains. <laughs> just being so over the top and yep. corny and... So in, in Idol Mastermind, there's Dr. Das, which is like an old tech guy. He's a scientist. Um, he has his computer that's taking over. There is um, Yara, who is like, she's um, kind of like a mob boss. Uh, and then there's um, LOL, who is like, <laughs> you think about like a, a Joker type character. He has gas that mm-hmm. he's using mm-hmm. to like take over the town and stuff like that. And as you play through each of them and then you take over the town and reset, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, as idle games. So idle mastermind is available okay. on, um, here on iOS. Okay. And, um, I assume I was trying to see, um, idle apocalypse and idle empires. Okay. There are other games and idle armies. So okay. a lot of idle games. Yeah. Uh, all right. I'm trying this out. I'm going to download okay. this. <laughs> right. All right. So uh, before the end of the podcast, we're going to check back in with him and see <laughs> how his, this idle game is going. And then we're going to check with Justin to see how he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this week I haven't played a whole lot. Um, I've been getting ready for playing for pets. So a lot of my uh Game console and PC time has been spent around making sure things are updated and ready to go, which I'm still not ready. So um, we'll see how that works out. Um, But anyways, uh, the one game that I did play in class the other day, so we had somebody from university marketing come in who wanted to shoot students in the video game class playing video games. Um, And so we brought in the Oculus Quest 2, and had students play uh, a few different games on that. And I actually did play some of Dance Central. And um, I danced in front of the class to Salt and Peppa's Push It. <laughs> Please tell me there's video of this. And University Marketing has some video of this somewhere. <laughs> I, I think that we need to contact University Marketing and get that video ASAP. And one of let- the highlights of my career as a student is being in class and watching Justin uh, dance to push it. <laughs> Do not let this become lost media. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> Um, it, it was really one of those situations where I'm going through the track list and going, I don't know any of these songs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who half these artists is, uh, artists are. And I got down to salt and Peppa and I was like, all right, I know who they are. <laughs> I know this song. <laughs> I, I don't feel like I've ever danced to that song, but, <laughs> <laughs> and I probably never will again. Uh, but that was my experience of something that I played this week. I did play a little bit more of Elden Ring, but nothing um, groundbreaking or new to report on with that. The um, other thing that um, I've been busy with is I did watch the second episode of the Halo series. And so last week I kind of talked about that. The second episode is really kind of a downer. <laughs> um It's not nearly as interesting as the first episode. It also, I think, shows the budget limitations of the show uh, a lot more. So they're they're supposed to be on a space station, and it really, really looks like they're on a set. Um, You know, it sort of reminds me of '90s sci-fi TV shows where it was clearly we're doing this on a set. Um, You know, most shows have kind of progressed beyond that. I feel like the Star Wars shows and the Marvel shows over on Disney Plus, they're putting enough money into those that they at least look film quality, even if they're not. Um, and this very much at times looks like TV quality. And I, I think that hurts it a little bit. I also think that the second episode was um, providing some backstory, but it's not necessarily the backstory that I think fans want. Um, I hope that they're going somewhere interesting with this. Um, that first episode had some promise. The second episode kind of let down that promise. So here's hoping that the third episode pays off some of that promise uh, to keep people on because otherwise it feels very generic sci-fi. Um, and I think this episode even more so because Master Chief walks around even outside of his armor through a lot of this episode. Yeah. And, um, you know, then it's just space guy in space, <laughs> um, you know, which... 
would make for a great Rift Tracks episode. It's <laughs> <laughs> maybe not the the halo people are looking for. Um, all right. That does it for what we've been playing and everything. But our big question of the week is, which game would you most like to see a sequel to? So preferably something that a sequel has not already been announced uh, for. So Breath of the Wild 2 doesn't count. <laughs> um, all right, Ryan, what game would you most like to see a sequel to? Okay. Okay, before I even say this, I'm going to say, after we talked about the Gex games, I'm like, what if there was Gex Max, like a game about Gex, like after his failed video game career, trying to run like a failed Tex Max restaurant, like it's not doing so well. It's and it's uh, just him trying to run that, and then people keep coming in. It's like, hey, weren't you the guy from this video game? Leave me alone. But does he have a drinking problem? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I imagine, like I imagine him, like he smoked six packs a day here. Oh, something. okay, but, okay. Um, but I really, what I want is, and I guess it. It's been announced, but then canceled as a Mega Man Legend 3. <laughs> He's been stuck in space for 20 years. Somebody get him down. Ryan, somehow I knew you were going to say Mega Man Legends. It's, I love that. <laughs> like, I I mean, on one hand, there's a part of me that's worried that they're go- they would do it, and then they would do, like, a bad job with it, like, after so many years. But it's just... Like, wanna... Mighty Number no. 9. The, like, spiritual uh, Mega Man sequel that they oh, made. Yeah. Um... But those games were just so magical at the time. Like I, like I think those were the games that gave me the best feeling of exploration and anything. I'm um, just digging around, finding parts that you would find out later. I was like, oh, this can help make a weapon, and uh, and then like then building those weapons and then leveling them up and then continuing exploring and doing that. And I just I love those games, and I I want a third one, and I I, I want Mega Man to get off the moon. <laughs> left, left him on the moon at the end of the game, and he's been there for twenty years. Somebody get him down. We we cared enough about Matt Damon for some reason to get him down Let's, <laughs> multiple times. By the way, let's get Mega Man down. Ground what? control to Mega Man. <laughs> he's like uh, Doctor Manhattan, right? Isn't Doctor Manhattan on the moon, or is he on Mars? He was on Mars. I Mars. Think. Okay, I'm thinking of. Um, the Netflix series from Umbrella Academy. Yeah, that, oh yeah, that guy one. is yeah. stuck on the moon, right? Mm-hmm. Well, he's well he now. was he pre was, pre show, right. and then he came back. Maybe he's stuck there, tired of cow. I'm tired of this company. Their their problems. <laughs> <laughs> um, OJ, what game do you most want to see a sequel to? So I have been thinking lo- a long time about this, uh, and I think Final Fantasy VI. Because we have, I mean, it's its own sequel in there because it has, like, the the world of balance and the world of ruin. Um, and I think I would like to see a story after Kefka is defeated um, and people, like, rebuilding finally after all of the change that happened with that. Um, so I would really like to see where all the characters went from there. Um, and I, I, I know there was a sequel to Final Fantasy IV, kind of, like yeah. after years with the kids. I don't want it to be like that. I want it to be like the full characters from Final Fantasy VI. Yeah, that that seems like one that they should do because that's one of the most beloved entries in the franchise. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's right up there with Final Fantasy VII and everything, I feel like. Yeah. Um, and so it, it seems like one that there would be a lot of desire for that, even if they went mm-hmm. back and did it in the original sprite graphic style mm-hmm. and everything. Um, I would prefer it to be like that rather than like Strangers of Paradise type thing. So, Well, didn't they even do like an H, like a 2D HD remake of it recently? Yeah, they did those pixel remasters, mm-hmm. and so they yeah. did release that, and they actually, for that, went back in and changed some scenes, like uh, the, the opera house scene they did in that HD 2D style. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, they've done some work. So, you know, they could just take that work and build off of it, Mm it would seem like. Um, Though I don't know that I trust Square currently to (laughs) do anything that approaches, like, to me, that's one of my favorite games of all time. And, Mm -hmm. like, I just don't know you can ever follow that up. It's like, you know. Right trying to make a sequel to your favorite movie of all time. Mm-hmm. You know they're going to mess it up on the process. You find one of your favorite characters is voiced by Gilbert Gottfried. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or Chris Pratt. Tara just keeps on saying chaos. 
I mean, that is now established canon. They could bring the Chaos Bros mm -hmm. into this game. Yep. Yep. So Chris Pratt is Kefka. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> 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 just that ruined my day because <laughs> they would so do that they would totally go and do that and you know. no. real talk you know who they should cast mark hamill yes we, yes. Yeah, he's actually good he is yeah. amazing oh, yeah. we've like, seen him do joker we've seen him do trickster mm -hmm. skeletor Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, just yep. get just get Mark Hamill, and then it will be perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they they never would. They would never do anything that smart. That Square is. <laughs> I don't know. If Square is stupid or like insane. Like it, it's hard to tell. Like they just make such bizarre decisions lately. And mm -hmm. um, maybe they're who Sony buying. There have been rumors that somebody might buy them because they are not in great shape right now, and certainly uh, Strangers of Paradise did not help that. Yeah. And so their, um, you know, their their Western development has been faltering, and their you know Japanese RPG development has been faltering. So there have certainly been rumors that they might be what's up for bid. And it, they would make a lot of sense for Sony. They would probably not sell to Microsoft, but Sony would make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, there in Japan. Um, all right, Alicia, uh, what game would you most like to see a sequel to? So I have to make an obligatory shout out to Sly Cooper Four: Thieves in Time because that yeah. had a terrible cliffhanger ending. But I think the one I'm going to really go into on this is more of I want a prequel to the Castlevania, Aria of Sorrow, and Dawn of Sorrow games. So in those games, Aria of Sorrow is set in 2035. And you find out that in the Battle of 1999, Dracula was destroyed for good, air quotes. Mm -hmm. But I w He always is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I would love to see them go back and do a game for the Battle of 1999, mm -hmm. where you would get to play as Julius Belmont and have one of the Belnatuses with you, have Alucard. And I specifically, I want this to... I, I want this to happen, but I want it to happen in the future. I want them to release it in 2035 to line <laughs> up with when Aria of Sorrow is set. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I hope that they get on it fast. That way it'll be a good game and they have plenty of time for development. <laughs> but that is 13 the one for me. years. Like, mm -hmm. that should be a very good game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I would accept it earlier, but just for mm -hmm. the poeticness of it, right. I want it to be released in 2035. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe they can do a reissue of it in 2035. <laughs> a reissue, a sequel, give us something of Julius when he has amnesia. I don't know. <laughs> but that's what I would really like to see. Because I think those are my favorite Castlevania games. You know, They were the first ones that I got into. And so having the chance, I think, to be able to go back and play as Julius and explore that would be amazing. Those are the Game Boy Advance ones, right? Um, Aria was Game Boy Advance. I think Dawn was Game Boy DS. Yeah, that is DS because it's in the initials, Dawn of Sorrow. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah, uh, they they just released those three uh, Game Boy Advance games in a package together recently. So um, if somebody has not played those games, you definitely should. Those are mm -hmm. fantastic games. Um, so I, I actually could not think of something that I, I really want. I, I guess the easy answer would be uh, beyond, beyond Good and Evil. And there has been a Beyond Good and Evil 2 announced years ago. And it looked like an insane game that would never actually come out. And big surprise, it never has come out. <laughs> so, um, you know, that expectation, I think, has been fulfilled that it will we'll probably never actually get a Beyond Good and Evil 2. Um, and the main developer, main designer behind that series has left video games entirely. So who knows? Um, that's probably never going to happen. So a game that I think could happen, and I think that Nintendo could do it, though I don't think they ever will, is to make another Star Tropics. Oh, yeah. Mm. So um, if you don't know, Star Tropics was a sort of overhead action RPG game. So very Zelda-like, the original uh, Zelda on the NES. 
the Star Tropics games. There were two of them. They came out on the NES. They were sort of Nintendo's attempt to more appeal to Western sensibilities with a game. Um, and they were just like fun games. Um, the original Star Tropics still has one of the most bizarre sort of breaking the fourth wall moments. Uh, you get to a point in the game and you have to be able to punch in a code. And the way that you got that code was by dipping a page of the game manual into water and it <laughs> revealed the code for you. So as a kid, you're renting this game and you don't have that code. <laughs> <laughs> so you just could not progress or anything in it. Uh, but it's a really fun game. It, not the most amazing game, uh, but it feels like they could bring it back and really do something new and different with it than uh, the Zelda games. And, you know, they could definitely do it in a remake, um, do it in the style of the Link's Awakening remake, mm. that sort of uh, force perspective and everything. And, you know, that would still fit with the style of the original game and uh, I think look amazing like that Zelda game did. So that's my answers. A well, new there Star was a Tropic. push for... What, the main character is Mike or something like that? Yeah. There was a push to have him be in the Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, which, of course, didn't happen. But I feel like Star Star Tropics fans are out there, and they'd yeah. be down for that. Yeah. There are literally dozens of us. <laughs> <laughs> we are Legion. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a fun game. And I think there are people who have very strong, you know, nostalgia for it at this point. And um, it, it seems like now, around now, would be the right time to bring it back, potentially, for Nintendo. Um, all right, that does it for us this week. Uh, I want to thank again Alicia, Ryan, and OJ for joining me. I want to thank our audience for tuning in again. Tune in to playingforpets.com this Thursday and Friday from 8 to 8 on both days, and we will be live streaming, playing video games to benefit the um, St. Francis Care Animal Shelter. So, you know, have some fun watching video games, but also do some good in the process. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll be back soon with a new episode.